All right, everyone. Today on the show, we have Hunter Hess. For those of you who don't know Hunter, he's on the uh, U.S. Free Ski Halfpipe team and is one of the stars of the Magma videos. So if you haven't seen Magma 1 or 2, I definitely recommend that you guys go check those out before listening because we go deep on behind the scenes for both of them. Hunter's a great guy, and this episode was a lot of fun to record, so hope you guys like it. Uh, we wrap up with some viewer questions, which can be submitted on our Instagram, at 2 Pod. As always, if you like the show, be sure to subscribe and give us a rating. DMs are open if you have any suggestions for the show. And, yep, let's get into it. Here's Hunter. Cool. All right, so we'll start off. So who are you, and what do you do? Uh, my name is Hunter Hess, and I ski. I just ski. <laughs> So, uh, Hunter, you're looking tan, you're looking healthy. So where are you coming from right now? Uh, I'm in California currently just fucking surfing and hanging out at my, uh, I have like some family out here. So I've just been hanging out with them and surfing nonstop and just trying to like, I don't know, get away from the snow a little bit. I spent all year on snow. So I was just like ready to just get out for just a little bit before we start going again. Yeah. Did you get out to hood in uh, May? Yeah, I went out there for... Uh, like two or three weeks just tried to like film a little bit and it was just like we were we were out there on a mission it was terrible it was so bad like just like pissing snow the whole time like wet terrible snow and we were sleeping in the van and we were just like we were so miserable uh it was uh Owen Dahlberg and myself my like the guy who films all the magma movies and so we were together for yeah just in this van freezing for like two three weeks and it, it sucks so bad but we got like a few good days i was like okay and then i'll be going back at the end of this month to ride for the summer for a little bit all right cool are you are you linking up with uh like wendell's or anything is that why you're going back or are you just going back for fun um, the u.s ski team has a has a, like a half pipe training camp out there so we'll just be out there for that so i i don't think it's a part of wendell's but i'll definitely be in like the wendell's lane a little mm, cool well, so the goal of this is to find out a little bit more about you. I know that there's kind of uh, your backstory's told like only a little bit bits and pieces around the internet. I've been searching for you, doing some research for this. Uh, so let's take it back to like where you're from. I know you're from Bend, Oregon. What was it like growing up there and where did it all start for you? Um, ben was sick. Ben was so sick when I was younger. It was just like, it, it was, it was super fun. I actually grew up not skiing very much I didn't like skiing at all I was just not like a fan of the cold or anything and then um, I just played soccer for a while and then that got way too hectic and I started out ski racing for a little while um, it, uh, with a ski group called MBSEF and that was like the ski group I kept with the whole way it was like our club or whatever um, and so I, I rode with them for a super long time and then just I like I hated ski racing I like just like the the ski race itself was terrible but I loved like just skiing to the event because I gotta just like hit whatever I want to and just like ride around and cruise and I had a really fun time with that and then from there I uh I I, I just like slowly but surely started transferring into like park skiing and that whole scene and um and yeah, I don't know, Ben was like the, just, it was a great like epicenter for like the whole thing. There was like so many people coming out of there and skiing was like it, like that was all we did. There was nothing else to do. So, I mean, the mountain wasn't that far away, but it was like a pretty good, like low key town. And like, it was just all about skiing for us. Yeah. And so I've seen, uh, so when I was doing my research, I was reading some of your like athlete profiles that they have yeah. um, set up and it always mentions the soccer. So how into the soccer world were you when you were younger? Like, were you one of those club kids that was, that was like driving an hour to go to a premier, you know, soccer academy? <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, I was like in it. Like that was, my sister did it forever. She actually went to Delphi University on the East Coast um, and she was playing there for like a year or two and that didn't work out. So then she went back, but like soccer was like just a huge deal in our family. Like my sister traveled everywhere for it. I traveled everywhere for it. Just, I mean, all in like Oregon and stuff, but we would just go out all the time. And that was all we did was just play soccer. And that was like, all my homies were just like, it was, it was just like a team, you know, you were always with them. Like your parents were going everywhere with, with you, just like trying to get you to events and everything. And my mom wasn't really the biggest fan of the soccer, but, and so she was the one that would take me skiing. 
my dad like just loved the soccer so he was the guy that was like pushing us for soccer all the time so we played soccer forever but it, it just became like way too political not so much about just playing it was more about money and like all this shit and the craziest soccer parents and everything and there was like there was just way too much circling around like the whole ordeal so i was i i didn't like it and i started to like skiing more and that started becoming more of a thing and i think for like my parents it was a pretty pivotal type of ordeal you know like it's like well do we let our kid do this thing that we know literally nothing about you know like i mean they had no idea they like took me a, like a few of the contests and they supported me with it fully but it like definitely in the beginning they're like what do we do here like do we really let him just go off and do this whole ordeal and they knew like the soccer route really well because they'd been through it with my sister or were going through it with my sister um but they decided to kind of let me lead the way a little bit in that aspect and yeah I just ran with skiing for as long as I could hell yeah and so what age were you when you made that transition uh, I was probably like 12 maybe 11 11 or 12 or something that's pretty cool like middle school and your parents are letting you kind of decide your uh your journey that's a pretty good age to like start making decisions you know like yeah, hey i don't uh, want to play soccer anymore mom like, I'm sick of <laughs> yeah no it was, it was sick they were they were super cool about it and they've been really cool about it, like the whole time and they've done everything that they could to just like make sure that they were like helping me in the correct direction you know it wasn't it, like like they just like finding every i mean it's, it, the whole thing's pretty confusing when you're like not involved in it all, at like at all like what contest does he go to like what's good what's not good you know and like for them I mean at that time it was all about contests and there was a lot of people from Ben just like helping them out and like they just put trust in other people so it was it was really cool yeah so you grew up riding at Mount Bachelor yeah. and uh I'm from the east coast so I don't know too much about um what it's like growing up on like the west out west and all those mountains but how did you transition from you know, I understand how you get into ski racing, but how do you get into something like half pipe? And like, where do you, what are the intro steps for that? Cause that doesn't seem like something that's super easy to just approach on your own, you know? No, for sure. Um, I don't know. The half pipe thing is kind of confusing. I like, I didn't start out running half pipe. My bachelor, like never had a half pipe. Half pipe was just like, it was just something that, that over time really happened. But like the freestyle side of things, there was this guy named Brad Jacobson and, uh, and he his snow his uh, son is a snowboarder who was actually on the U.S. Uh, pipe team for a while. Nathan Jacobson, we call him Duder. And so um, uh, Brad was a really really like well known like uh, ski coach for a while. You know he would just train people all the time. So he talked to my dad and like said like hey like your son is he's good at skiing but he's not that good at skiing. <laughs> like he doesn't know how to ski and if he wants to learn how to do all this he needs to learn the fundamentals. You know so. I always remember like a big thing was like putting pressure in your uh, like the tongue of your boot, you know, and like skiing with more of like a forward stance. So you were more in like the actual like, I mean, everyone always like leans back, you know, there was that straight legged type of thing, you know, and they're put they're putting it all on their calves. So a big thing he taught me was put it into your shins, you know, always being that forward stance. And that's how you aggressively ski. That's how you deal with like anything that comes your way. And so Brad taught me a ton and he was actually the guy that took me to like my first like uh, bigger contest. It was nationals like USASA nationals or whatever. So that was in copper. And so I, I went with him and uh, Duder and we, we all like went together. And from there, it just like he, he, he wasn't he wasn't even freestyle. He wasn't freestyle oriented at all. He was just like a skier, you know, and like he just wanted to rip around and like do that. And so I think I did that with him and then I think one other dude for a little while and then that like like they just rode the mountain so I would just ride the mountain with them and then uh, uh, like that the park seems like the most fun thing you could do you know you like look at everyone they're like flying so you're like all right I want to go and do that so I started to like go towards that direction and then I was in I actually grew up going to a catholic school when I was super young um till like I think I think it was like fourth grade or something and I actually had dyslexia so I would I had a super super hard time reading and like doing all this stuff and they don't believe in dyslexia they don't believe in like many learning disabilities at all so I got out of there and then went to a public school and I met the Ferguson brothers I don't know if you know them like Gabe and Ben Ferguson 
they're <laughs> um, names, yeah yeah they're snowboarders and so i met them um and this other kid named fisher brownrig and uh, they were just like some local local guys and they actually like they ended up talking to me about the local event that would go on just like a slope style event up the mountain and so I convinced my dad to bring me up there one day and he brought me up there and I had no clue how the event worked or like anything and I ended up being like trying to do a flip I think and I I just wanted to do a front flip or something so I, <laughs> I fucking do this front flip land it skip all the other features like literally just ski straight down. it was the first jump and it was like terrible weather I landed it my goggles are like on my eyes I look up at my dad and I'm like claiming you know like all stoked and uh I I skied straight down the mountain and I'm like I won like I won that for sure you know <laughs> and all these kids who had like actually been doing it I like get like third place or something you know but it was just like from there it just like really just started something you know and just like started to realize like that you could be competing you know and 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 from there you just go like all right I'll do the next little local contest and that whole there was like a really big community and bend of it and, and like they were all just like really supportive parents you know just like cool kids and so i that was like i started growing a friend group there and started being a part of that like crew and um and yeah like i just kept doing all those contests and then i just was fully into freestyle skiing from there mm -hmm. wow man so d so it was always in a structured environment you weren't just doing one-off rail jams for a little bit of cash like you were always part of the of the system if you yeah, were yeah no fully i mean yeah i i like i was it was all like the big goal at the end of the year was nationals if you could get to nationals it was just for me it was like the most fun thing ever i mean you got uh, have you ever been to copper mountain uh no i have not it's like a it's like a little ski town and you're just kind of like stuck in this little ski town but for us when we were younger it's like you go to this little ski i mean it's not that great if you just go like fuck like i don't know i don't want to just hang out in copper now ever but <laughs> when you're younger and all these other kids are there and you guys all just ski and you like got this like uh, i don't know they spot monster used to sponsor it and they would like give us like monsters and stuff like little like rug rats just running around off energy drinks and like stuff and you're just like by yourself uh it, it was like the sickest thing so my big thing was like i just always wanted to go to nationals when i was younger so i would compete all year and just like try to get there yeah. So you're learning all about skiing. Your parents are learning all about, you know, the structure of it. Um, so how did you like get embedded into ski culture? Cause you know, you're just a soccer kid coming onto the ski scene. I'm sure like, where did you just start going on new schoolers and looking at videos? Like how, where was your inspiration coming from when you finally were like, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's be, let's do the slope style thing. Let's do the free ski thing. Um, I never knew about new schoolers, actually. I never watched ski videos growing up, like, at all. Like, I think the first ski video I really saw was, like, every day is a Saturday. Like, it was, like, pretty late down the line, you know? Like, it wasn't like I was, like, I, I mean, more recently in my life, that stuff has played a bigger role. Like, I go back and I watch that stuff now, and that that's, like, more inspiring now than, like, anything ever, you know? But, um, when I was younger, it was kind of just our crew. Like I, I grew up with um, Jake Majot, Mr. Mango. Wow. Yeah, so him and I were like best homies. Like that was like, we had one day where we built a pow jump and um, like with MBSEF because he was doing that too. And so him and I were just trying flips, like just landing our ass, like not doing any, like it wasn't good. Um, but then we like went back and that night actually my mom, and dad took me to like a little like they like went to like some barbecue it was just like some or it was like a dinner or something like something like any parent would go on just like a party type thing and uh jake was actually there with his mom that night and so i saw him it was just super random and i was like hey man and we were like hey like that was fun today and so that was it like for from then on it was just jake and i like just battling out against each other. And we had some guys at Bachelor that were like the guys that we looked up to, Lucas Watts and uh, this other guy named Connor Bennett. And those were like the dudes that we like looked up to. And so the only goal was to like be like them for a while. And then we started to like know bigger dudes. For me, it was Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown was like the, like the goat of everything. Like I, he was a superhero to me. Like 
there's nothing that could compare like I would I, I don't know if I could ever look up to anyone like that ever like he was just the coolest guy ever and then like Sammy Carlson for a while because he was a hood guy and a lot of our coaches like knew him personally and so it just like from there it was always it wasn't like I don't know and and B and E was a part of like their life like Jake grew up watching that more so and like they would always like kind of like get me more into that but I, I didn't really grow up watching a lot of that. It was just Bobby because he was the best. And then it was just like a little competition between like my buddies and I. Like that was just, that was it. That's crazy because like you're you're working on so many great, you know, parts now and, and, and videos now. So it's like, surpri- it's honestly surprising that you weren't kind of embedded in that culture before like you became a part of it. So that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. So, um, so where does it evolve from here? Because you said that, you were like the the pie in the sky, if you will, was nationals at the end of the year. So how did it evolve into something bigger? And you're like, okay, let's do this for like a career and let's actually make something out of this. Um, it was it was just like a long process of just like trying to be better. It wasn't like I, I don't know, like I, I just I don't know, I don't know if I even like wanted to be like a it it wasn't even like a thought it was kind of just like word I'm just gonna do this and I'm just gonna keep doing this for as long as I can you know and it wasn't even like it, it wasn't like there was an end goal or anything like I just looked up to the Bobby Bobby was like the main guy and I aspired to be like him and like those guys and I would just go ski every single day and just try to just be better than my buddies you know and like it was <laughs> that was literally it like we would go and we'd go to these contests at Bachelor and then um and then uh, try get sponsors and stuff. We wanted sponsors really bad, you know, like just wanted to get free stuff all the time. Like that was like the cool thing. And um, we would go to nationals and they have all these like goodie bags that you can get and you would just like want to do well. And I would, I would do that. And then um, I guess if like from like tra- like transitioning on, I think Jake was like the main like guy that like led me in a certain direction, you know, like he, um he got he actually got on the u.s ski team it was the rookie half pipe team first and so i didn't even know that was a thing you know like i i had no idea we were just like skiing like just competing we we started going like um rev tours revolution tours at that point and started to do those and like maybe here and there just like get into like some world cups you know like just like a long shot type thing but we would get into like one or two and uh and our coaches at mbsef they would always kind of like they knew more than we did you know they like like uh, i just like when i started getting older i was just like i just want to go to x games like i want to be in x games that was always the thing so then it was just like all right all the coaches came together and like figured out plans on like what contest to go do next so it was like well you got to do rev tours if you do well at rev tours you can do world cups if you do well world cups like maybe you get a shot x or do tour or whatever it was so uh, it was just like you just did these steps and then when jake got on the rookie half five team i was like oh man like that that's sick like i i gotta get on like i i just want to be on so bad because jake was on and that was like my like my dude so i was fucking grind it out really really hard for this one year like just like set goals for myself and like just started to like tick little boxes off and just like ended up killing it that year like pretty like did really well at all the rev tours like made finals at some of the world cups like was just like stoked on on how that year went i actually like i think i podiumed like a rev tour uh, slope style or something so that was like i was i was stoked i was just like doing well for myself um and then uh, at the end of that year, because I, I, or it was the, sorry for jumping around so much, but it was the year before that I like tried to get on the US rookie team, didn't make it. And then this was the year that I killed it. And I was like, well, I must be getting on, you know, like I want, I need to be on. And they asked me at the end of that year to join the team. And it was like a really, really cool moment, big moment for me. Like my parents were there, it was sick. And then got on and then just started traveling with those guys. And from there, it's just like a straight shot. Like you just like you move up, hopefully to the US pro half pipe team. Um, once you're there, you are hopefully just fucking winning events and doing well and making money and doing whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's sick. And uh, I think that brings us 
like pretty pretty up to date. But if we could take a step back, um, so so you're doing the slope style, yeah. How, so how do you make that transition over to to the half pipe? Because it's definitely a a, a different type of of skiing for sure. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Um, I just I skied slope style forever because that was it was way more fun than half pipe. Half pipe sucked. Um, but my dad made me do everything when I was younger. He was still like a bit of a soccer dad, so he was trying to make me do every event. I I did skier cross for a while too because you could win like the overall at nationals or whatever. So <laughs> he made me do everything. So I just did everything and uh, half pipe was easier it was it was a lot easier like there was a bunch of people in slope style uh like like i mean every rev tour there was like 80 kids or whatever it was 60 kids or something and it was it was a ton of people you know so i i didn't see myself being able to stand out in that area so i was kind of like well i think that there's way less people in half pipe i think i can do pretty well at it you know and so just slowly but surely I started putting more, more of my eggs into the half pipe, you know, like just being more into that. And that was kind of the realm that I wanted to be in. And, uh, and uh, it just ended up kind of sticking like that last year when I got put on the rookie team, they're like, well, you're on the pipe team, but we still want you to focus on slope style and do that whole thing. But I was, uh, I, I just, I couldn't keep up with those dudes. They were, their, their air awareness was way above mine, like everything and i could i could like ride a half pipe relatively well at that point and so i just kind of stuck with that and just decided that i could learn that mm -hmm. and do you kind of do you do you prefer one over the other or, or are you just comfortable doing half pipes and there's less competition so you're like screw it i'll just keep going with half pipe uh half pipe now has grown into like a full different thing for me like i mean half pipes more like you think it's more like mellow you end up slamming way harder and like pipe it's just like you have way less room for error you know so you just you like take way harder like or i mean you could take hard slams anywhere but it's just like you you slam a lot more you know you don't really know what you're doing as much and um but over time just because i've ridden so much half pipe now like i mean i go and i hit jumps for like a little bit and like maybe some rails every once in a while but like half pipe to me is just like the shit like you never feel better like like you ride a good half pipe like a spring pipe or um it, like i don't know even pipes in the winter and it's just like i i just think it's the best feeling it's where i feel like the most powerful the most like in control of my like skis like everything like it's just like i don't know it's such like a fine-tuned area for me that's just i like if you're gonna give me an option i'm gonna pick the half pipe every time mm -hmm. yeah and so uh so you're on the u.s free skiing team and looking at uh like some of the fis results so it looks like pretty consistently you're going between the u.s canada new zealand china and france i don't know if i'm missing any locations um for events you're saying yeah for events exactly mm -hmm. yeah so what was it like once you started actually traveling around and like going around the world to to compete for these events uh that was sick that was when i first got on the uh, uh u.s team I watched this recap from one that like this uh, snowboarder. Um, I think it was Chandler Hunt or something. <laughs> and I watched this like recap on his like season or something. And it's them partying in Switzerland, like hanging out at these bars and stuff and just like traveling with all their buddies. And I was just like, I was traveling before that a little bit, but never international. I never went on like an international trip. It was all in the U S. And so I was just like, wow, like no way I get to be a part of this. And I just remember just like, thinking of myself like oh man this is gonna be so cool um and the first international trip we went on was to new zealand and it was it was just so sick like just it's literally like looking back on it it's it's the coolest thing to be able to do is it like you're literally like 16 17 years old traveling with all your like best friends at the time in these like remote places you know you're going to new zealand you're going to france you're going to switzerland you're going to canada like you're going everywhere and it's like you adapt and you are like it's like your little family you know and you go everywhere with all your buddies all the time and i mean it's it's the coolest shit for like a while it's just it's so sick mm -hmm. yeah and in those early days who's who's foot in the bill for all those travel expenses and entry expenses and everything because at first i mean they're definitely you probably have to pay your way right 
Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, yeah, my, my parents helped me out a lot. Like, I mean, we, I'm like, my parents financially are like relatively okay. You know, like they didn't have a ton of money. My dad was a construction worker. My mom was like a personal trainer. So we weren't like killing it, but they just supported me in any way they could. Um, they were always just like pushing me to go out and do these things. And I think for them too, like you, your, your kid gets on the U S ski team, like that sounds pretty cool, you know? And so you're just like, you're going to New Zealand right now. Like, they're like, all right, man, like go and get it, like go and work hard and like have fun, like do your thing. So yeah, in the early days, I mean, they were just like always just backing at a hundred percent. So, I mean, it sucks because skiing is definitely a financially, uh, like it's a, it's a expensive sport, you know, it's really, really expensive. And, uh, you gotta have some money to like get into it. Um, but yeah, I was very fortunate and my parents were backing me a hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And it seems like your parents were, you know, cause you said that your sister did a kind of a similar process with soccer. It seems like your parents were just willing to support, um, like any athletic endeavor you guys were doing. Like, I, I don't think many parents would, would fully back their kid go, going for a dream like this. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. No, it's, it's remarkable. My parents are literally the best. Like they are always supporting me in anything I really want to do. And the, um, especially when we were younger, just like being able to go and chase a goal, you know, and have these like dreams and ambitions. And they were, they were, I mean, it's not, it, it's not like I leave for a week and I'm good, you know, I'm gone for six months out of the year, you know, and I'm training all the time and my grades are like falling, you know, I'm, I'm get, I, I got kicked out of school like 15 times or something like literally like, like kicked out of school. I had to go re-enroll every single time because I was gone for too long, you know? And I like, and they just helped me every single step of the way, like getting me the right counselors and like getting me the right people to talk to so I can graduate high school on time and like being in that crew and like still trying to get me to learn as much as I can while just like trying to progress my skiing and seeing where it actually goes. And I mean, at any point in time, I could have been like, Hey, like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too much, you know? And they would have backed me a hundred percent if I wanted to do that. And I just stuck with it. And like skiing was it, you know, and it, there was no like second thought or anything. I was just like, I'm going to ski. And they were just like, here, man, like do, do what you want. Like supported me the whole way. And it was, it was, and it wasn't just them. They were the biggest ones for sure. But I mean, it was like, it was everyone. I had some teachers that killed it. I had like a lot of my family members, they helped me a ton. And like, it was so many people that were just like backing me a hundred percent. And like, without that, like I would never be skiing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And so like in the back of your mind, or maybe even like some, coming from your parents, was there ever a plan, like a, a backup plan or like any suggestion that you might want to consider taking like a more traditional route? Or was it always just out of the question that like you're doing, you're doing the athlete thing and that's, and that's it. No questions. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It, like in the beginning, there was never like, it was, it was just skiing, but then you do get to a point where it's like, all right, like this is pretty serious, man. You know, it's like, you're not going to be going to college, you know, like you're going to be just doing this and traveling with this team and doing these things. And there's definitely moments when you're like, I have no idea if I, like decided, you know, if, if, if I'm in a good place, you know, like you do poorly at contests, like money's not coming in for a while you get like, I mean, a lot, like there's no money a lot of the time, you know, and you're sitting there, you're struggling financially. You're trying to keep yourself up. You're trying to like, you're like, damn, should I just go back to school? Should I do this? Should I do that? Um, and you're just trying to like figure it out the whole way. But at the end of the day, there's just something that always is just like bringing you back in, whether it's just like an addiction to the whole thing, or you just love skiing as a whole, you know? Um, and, and for me, I, I have, and like had, and I still do have like just so many goals, you know, that it, it's that like, I, I got to do those and then I can look at other areas of my life, but there's, has never really been a plan B. It's just always been like, do this and try to get it done, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like sink or swim, basically. You exactly. just got to do it. Yeah. So, so you're the first guest I've had on that's actually like really involved in, in the competition circuit. So if you wouldn't mind, like, could you explain kind of like what, what your calendar is for the year? Cause I'm yeah. assuming that's, it's pretty cyclical and like you have an off season and then like kind of the same events come up. So what's, so what's that schedule look like for you? 
Um, so normally we go like, let's say our year starts because the competition year will start in uh, copper, right? So that'll be the first pipe comp that we have of the year or on, on like, um, I think every other year or something, we would go to uh, New Zealand. So New Zealand would be in, I think, August. So we would go to New Zealand, we would compete in New Zealand, um, do that whole thing. Uh, there was one contest, so we'd all travel there, or there was a camp or something, which would maybe be in September or something. We'd go there, we would do that, then we would come back, um, be back for like a week or two or whatever. Then we would go actually to Switzerland, um, go train there. Um, some years, like the past like year or two after Switzerland, we go to Austria. So we're in Switzerland for like two weeks. Then we go to Austria, train for another like week or two. So we're in, we're in Europe for like four weeks or something. Then the first comp happens, which would normally be copper. Copper goes down. After that was normally due to her. Um, and this is like all in December. And then right at the end of this of December, for the past few years, we've gone to China. So then there's a World Cup in China. Um, and then you fly back like the 23rd of December or something right before Christmas or like Christmas Eve or something. And then you have like a week or two to chill. Then we'll probably have like a training camp in Copper Mountain. And then that will be for like two or three weeks or something. Then we'll have a comp either in like Aspen or that, that comp test is that, that contest is always like, like could be Aspen could be copper. Um, but like normally that's like the realm. And then we go from there to maybe you like X games that year. And then right after X games go to mammoth, um, and do a world cup there. And then after that, you go to probably like the final event of the year, which is the Calgary world cup. And then after that, you have like probably like a month to of just like no real skiing, or maybe it's like two weeks or something of, of no real skiing. Um, and you can kind of fill that in with whatever you want. That's when Alex and I, like last year, were able to film Magma 2. And then um, from there, you go to um, a mammoth training camp. And that's like our spring training camp. Then after that, a few weeks after that, you go to Hood for a Hood training camp. And then a few weeks after that, you're in New Zealand again for the World Cup and it all starts over again. So it's a very like time consuming, crazy ass schedule. Like it's it's super nuts, but that's generally our year right there. Yeah. So you're just you're just living in hotels the whole year, basically. Yeah. Fully out of a bag. Like I, I I've never personally rented a spot like I, I, I don't because I'm just I'm never anywhere for longer than like a month or two or three weeks, you know? And if I am like, it's just, it, there, it, it makes no sense for me to stop anywhere. So I've just been on the road for a super long time. Yeah. And does the, does the team, do they hook it up with like your own room and, you know, you got nice accommodations or are you guys ever cramming in, you know, two uh, in a room? You're, you're cramming in sometimes. I mean, they do their best, but they got a budget to work with too. And it's never been that big of a budget. So um, they're doing their best to like hook us up with good spots, but definitely some years, um, especially when you're like on the rookie team that's coming out of your pocket and stuff like you're, you're cramming in a spot, you know, I mean, it's no big deal. You're a kid and you don't care. I mean, even now, like, I, I don't care where I go. Like, it's totally fine anywhere we go. Um, but yeah, you're, you're definitely like cramming in zones. A lot of the time bunk beds, Europe is always just a mission, you know, China's crazy, um just like i mean think about it. you got people that are, are trying to figure out how to get the entire ski slope style ski half pipe snowboard slope style snowboard half pipe entire team around you know you're getting these buses you're you're getting these hotels you're doing all this stuff you know you got condos you got houses you got everything you're trying to figure it out for the full year and you're trying to stay within a budget so like whatever whatever goes goes you know you you figure it out as you go but they always kill it and i mean we, we always, you got a roof over your head every night. So you're pretty chill. Yeah. And so you, you hinted at this a little bit with um, talking about when you're on the rookie team. Um, so what's the financial side of this? Like, so like, what are you expected to contribute as the athlete? And then when does the money actually, when do you actually start seeing money coming back? Um, because at first, from what I've heard and from what I understand, it's a lot of just you pay until you're finally at the level where you could start making money. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's kind of it, you know, um, you, 
you pay for, I think uh, when you're on the rookie team, you're paying for housing, I think. Um, or maybe they cover some housing or I don't, th- I don't think they cover housing. So I think you're, you're paying for your housing. It's split between everyone that's there. So it's, I mean, it's more affordable for sure, but you're paying for your flights, you're paying for your food, you're paying, you're paying for everything at that point in time. Um, and then I think they, they pay for um, like entries to contests and stuff like that, which does add up at the end of it. Um, they pay for like camp fees sometimes or maybe they don't even at that point. Like it, it's very, it's very like you're, you're still pay, paying like a pretty penny, you know, they have a lot of financial like grants that you can get and stuff like that. Um, and, and there's a lot of like financial support that you can like, you can reach out to and get, and they try to make that as, as uh, accessible for you as possible. But you are for the most part, when you're on that rookie team, you're paying for most of it out of pocket. Um, and when I first got on the pro team, it was still kind of like that. They cover your housing um, and camp fees, which are a ton. Camp fee, I mean, you're paying 2,500 bucks to ride a half pipe for a week. Like, it, like, and that's just to be able to ride that half pipe. Like, it's not cheap at all. I think Mount Hood right now, from what I heard, is like crazy. You're paying like 400 bucks a day or something just to ride that pipe. Like, and it's well maintained, and they're putting money into it. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, the whole thing is, it. it I mean, the, they have the right people cutting it. They're like throwing salt on it. They got people grooming it halfway through the day. Like, it's that's what you got to pay for this stuff. But I mean, there's international teams that come here and they expect it to be the best, and they're willing to pay that that price. You know, and so. I mean, it's, it's an expensive thing. So they pay for that. And then also with the U S team, they have some like really good sponsors. So they uh, like, like we get pretty much all of our, all of our passes. We have a pass for anywhere we want to go. They like for free. So you have that all year long. So you're not, you're not paying for a pass anywhere. So that's a big hookup. I mean, if you're skiing 150 days a year, you know, or something like that, like you're skiing all year long. You're skiing every day. You're skiing copper. You're skiing mammoth. You're skiing Vail resorts. You know, like I mean, that's 200 bucks a day. You know, it's a thousand dollars for a season pass. So that definitely like saves you quite a bit of money. But now I think that they're 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 getting some more funding and stuff like that. And we've had problems with the funding and everything. So now um, I th- I think we're doing a little better. Mm-hmm. And when you're coming up is there anyone on the team whose parents can't afford to bankroll the whole thing? Like, is there any, I mean, for, like for lack of a better word, are there any poor kids that are, that are competing and skiing or do, is it kind of like by default, you have to have money to start with? Um, I mean, there's people that struggle with it, you know, I mean, yeah, not everybody's rich, you know, no, no like, like, I mean, my parents like, I mean, it's not an easy task at all. You know, you're putting money into this shit. Like it's, it's hard. Like my family definitely had like some problems getting there sometime, you know, and it's not like, I mean, it's not going to not put food on our table, you know, but luckily, luckily, you know, but it's, um, it's, it, we're all, we're all pretty fortunate, you know? And I mean, but you definitely got to have some parents that are dedicated to it that want you to achieve those things. And they're going to put their money on the line for it. You know, people make great sacrifices for it. Uh, like, like, big, big sacrifices for it, you know, like it's, it, uh, I mean, just like, to, to, I mean, Torn's story is crazy, you know, Tornier Wallace, like he, like his family was not in a great financial zone, like they could get him to certain places, but, and, and I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's like, I mean, there's, there's some crazy shit out there, you know, and I don't know everyone's financial background, but I mean, if you're, if you really can't get to the mountain, then you're not going to be able to travel the world with this team, like that's just, you can't be, you can't have that little of money, which is super unfortunate, but that's mm-hmm. kind of the reality of the sport, sadly. Yeah. Well, it's not like soccer where all you need is like feet and a ball to play. <laughs> like there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into skiing. Yeah. And I think a lot of things would stop uh, like a kid from being able to get into skiing or competitive skiing before getting to that level, which is so unfortunate. I mean, you're still paying a contest fee. You're paying 60 bucks or whatever, just to compete at a a event. And that event is every weekend. Right. And I mean, you need a ski pass, you need skis, you need boots, you need a helmet, you need goggles, you need all this shit. So it's, 
it's a it's a big chunk of change so i mean that is kind of the uh, like the natural selection of this this uh world that we live in Mm -hmm. yeah and so when does uh uh when does the money start coming back back to you like at what position in the rankings do you have to do you have to achieve before you start seeing some of that investment return um oh i don't i mean you you get some money back here and there you know you get sponsors and um you can make money every now and then from these events i mean you win a rev tour you get i think a thousand dollars or something you know so that that goes a certain distance and if you've got maybe a sponsor that's going to pay you a hundred bucks or something it's not it's not good money you're not going to make good money until you're winning x games and you got all the like you know you got energy drink companies like i i don't i i i break even maybe you know like every year like i'm 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 struggling every year, like for sure, you know, like it's never like you're coming back with like big, big full pockets and you got money, but, um, you, you, you can definitely make a pretty penny once you start winning the bigger contest and you have like con- some consistency and energy drink companies help a ton, you know, non-endemic, uh, sponsors help a ton, you know, I mean, you get a car deal, you get anything like that's, that's money that you're actually going to be seeing at the end of it. Anything you get, otherwise, you know, you got a ski company paying you, you got a goggle company paying you, you know, I, I mean, every year it's decreasing. There's more people, more hands in the pot, you know, like, more mouths to feed so it's decreasing people will take less so i mean every year it kind of goes down a little bit hopefully it shoots up a little but i mean skiing's it's hard man it's it's not a super well-paying sport and i mean i know a lot of guys that are some of the best skiers in the world and they got a summer job you know like it's the reality of the sport kind of mm-hmm. yeah i mean I've, and I've talked to a couple of athletes that that's what they all say it's like yeah i love skiing um, but I also have to love doing construction because that's how I pay my bills. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of the most talented athletes I've ever seen in the world. You know, these guys are remarkable, remarkable skiers and should be paid extraordinarily. You know, we should be living pretty good lives and there should be, um, better ways to go about it. But I mean, unfortunately that everyone is kind of struggling from some area and, a lot of people don't make money and they're sitting there and they're, they're doing it for the love of skiing, you know? And I think that's what people really got to realize is that, I mean, it's, it's all a place of love. Like, I mean, the majority of skiers, you know, you're watching an urban part. No one's, no one's going to make a fucking return on that. You know, like it's, <laughs> that's the reality of the situation. You know, they're, they're putting their lives on the line, you know, they're putting their bodies out there every single day going to work, you know, and this shit is not easy. Like it is not easy. You go out, you build a jump, you know, you're hiking these mountains. You're like working for these clips every single day. You're working for those contests, you know, to be on that podium and stand there for that second, you know, that you get, you know, that little minute of fame, you're working your ass off to achieve that. And so people put a lot of work into anything that they do. Any professional skier does it too. It's not, it's not, there's not many people laying down asking for their belly to be rough. Like it's a lot of people and they're getting fucking they're not making ends meet a lot of the time. And then they got to go out and work for the summer and do it all over again, because that's what they love and that's what they want to do. And so that is kind of the reality of, of the sport as of right now, unfortunately. Yeah. And do you know where some of these, you know, these non-endemic sponsorship contracts are, are, are ringing in at like what, what's the dollar value on those? Because looking from the outside in, it's hard to tell, like what a quote unquote good salary is in, in competitive skiing, because compared to, you know, like any different sports, it could be, it could be, you know, completely different. So do you have any idea? Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. on (laughs) Um, I mean, just cause I know people personally, you know, Okay. yeah. So it's Um, tough. It's, it's kind of hard. I mean, I, I know they're, their ski companies don't pay a whole lot right now. You know, you're, you're looking at, I don't know, somewhere in the, uh, I don't, I don't really know how much I can say, you know, but I do yeah, know yeah. That they're there. I mean, there are a lot of people that make a, a, a good living, you know, mm-hmm. like they, there, there are skiers out there that make a good living, you know, they're making, they're making six figures a year for sure. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's not common. No, that is, 
the top of the top, you know, you are killing it, you know, and you're not going to have that for many years. You are going to have that for a certain amount of time and you are going to work like really hard for that. Like they're, they're, it's, it's a, it's a handful of dudes, you know? Um, and I mean, most people could probably guess that handful of guys, you know, it's not mm -hmm. like a big mystery, but there are people that do make a, make a decent amount of money. You know, they should be making more, but they make enough for what they are doing, I guess. Yeah. I mean, well, it's just that level of like, like it's the top of, it's the top of our sport, but you look at the top of other sports and it just doesn't even compare at all. Like the top of the sport is the minimum. It's yeah. lower than the minimum for other it, sports. It's insane. I mean, I I I was literally just watching um a, a video with my cousin, and it was talking about um like Olympics and uh and how all these Olympic athletes, you know, like Lolo Jones and Michael Phelps and all these huge stars, you know, and they're talking about financial success, and a lot of them don't have it even in the slightest, you know. And those are, I mean, that's kind of the reality of a lot of Olympic sports, you know they're monetizing um the, they monetize these events pretty horribly they don't make it very entertaining for people to watch and so you're sitting there kind of wondering like well why aren't we making money like i, I mean action sports athletes as a whole are like they're they're remarkable athletes and and uh they go through some like uh mental battles and physical um expectations and everything that a lot of athletes will never go through you know like it's just it's insane what people do like it's it's literally insane and you look at the growth of what's happened you know like you're never gonna see a basketball player jump that much higher you know but you're gonna see a guy that 10 years ago was winning doing a a switch 1080 and now you got guys doing triple cork 1980s you know like it's like I mean, there's like it, the, the amount that we've grown in such a short amount of time is remarkable and no one's getting compensated for it. You know, like it, it's, it, 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 it's not happening, you know, like, it, and until someone really steps in and finds a way to just make it more of a viewable thing, you know, it, it, it won't really change. I don't think. Yeah. It's uh it's definitely complex and it's yeah. uh and just the difference between the, the compensation and the risk too is insane you know like the the injuries that that you could sustain in skiing are just so much greater than say in basketball for example no a hundred percent i mean it, it's it's nuts i mean you you get a guy that signs on that you're never going to hear of and he signs to the nba and he's making 15 million dollars a year or something you know and you're sitting there being like wow, I can be at the top of this sport, you know, I could win Olympic medals, and I can make six figures a year, like, that is a goal, like, that is what you want, if you're doing that, you're killing it, like, you are, you're killing it, but that's not even guaranteed to you, that's if you are able to sign the, the right deals, if that's, it, that's, like, if people really want to back you, that's what you're expected, like, that is your peak right there, and these guys like lowest level is that, you know, like if you're not making a million dollars a year, like, it's like, what are you doing here? You know, like it's not even worth it for them to go play on this court. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And I think it, it does come back to the the love of the sport. And that's something I wanted to touch on for you because, you know, that on the competition circuit, a lot of guys, they take the off season to just relax, you know, and yeah. you've mentioned, and you mentioned earlier that like the urban guys really do it for the love of it. Cause there's no money in that. And there's a ton of injuries. And so when did you go from the competition to scene to also in your free time making videos and like hitting urban and just doing, and doing that whole side of it? Yeah. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing was I, I, I watched a hall, you know, I watched Alex and that was, he was kind of like the guy for me, you know, like, I mean, he, he had goals that he wanted to achieve. I had goals I wanted to achieve. And he like had more of an idea. He, he's like a really like thought out individual, you know, I'm more of a guy that just like wants to go out and just like do something, you know, like him and I will go on tr like trips all the time, you know? And he's like, well, where are we going? What are we doing? I'm like, I don't know, man, let's just go do this. Let's do this. And he's like, no, why would we do that? Like, there's like, if you're going to hit an urban spot, there's no snow there. I'm like, oh, like, all right, then let's go here. Like, just tell me where to go. I'll go anywhere, you know? So he's really thought out and really planned out. And when we were younger, when I first got on the US team, he was talking to me and he had just won the slush cup. Like that was, that was like the big thing, right? He just won it. He beat Oystein, you know, we're all like, no way. Like Oystein was like 
top of the top an a-hall you know this little this kid he just beat him and we're sitting there and we're like i'm 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 like dude tell me what to do like tell me how to be a better skier and he looks at me and he's like man you just gotta ski all the fucking time like all these people are talking about working out like doing all this shit you don't need to do that like who cares like we need to go out and we need to ski all the time like just ski every single day all day long i was like all right like from then on i was like all right that's what i'm doing like if anyone's out i'm out like i'm skiing like that's what i want to do and that's all i cared for you know it was just like i want to be better so i skied all the time and i was super hungry you know like i i i wanted to succeed in 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 every single way i could you know i still do like there's just so many things like so many goals that you have and you're just like I want them so bad and they're so close and you're watching your friends succeed and they're getting taste of it, you know, and then they get the whole thing and you're like, all right, man, like all I want to do is just ski right now. So that's, that's what we did. And one thing transitioned to, into another. And it's like, I, a hall and I talked about filming magma for a super long time or something in the realm of that, you know, we just wanted to go out to Oregon and ski mountains and make a video about it. And, um, and one year we were at X Games and I was sitting there and I was like, hey, Hall, I think I think we should do it, dude. Like, we should really do this. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, whatever. You know, like kind of like, yeah, we'll do it. You know, like we've said for the past three years, because we talked about it for like two or three years before that. So he's like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, all right, we're actually going to do it. So from there, I was kind of like, I was like, this is this is the goal. So we're competing. We're doing all this stuff. But I want to make this video because you still you do want to be like those guys you know you want to make really big video parts video is a big big part of skiing you know like you got video projects you want to be the best in the world you got to show that you're the best in the world and everything like fuck that you just ride half pipe like like you're a great skier don't get me wrong but like that's not what it's about you know at least in my mind it was always about like just doing everything you know like if if i'm doing anything i'm doing everything like that was the goal you know you need to do everything t hall says it all the time like he talks about henrik and henrik just does like he does everything you know so i was just like all right man i want to be like them like this this opportunity is here like let's take it so i started talking to people and trying to figure it out trying to figure out where the cash would come from it didn't look like we had any but i could convince a hall to go and um we were riding up the chairlift one day and i talked to oystein brian about it and he decided that he would come too like and i thought he was joking you know like oystein was like he was still like one of the greatest you know <laughs> like oystein is was my like has been my favorite skier for a super long time you know i'm talking to him on the chair i like kind of like barely knew him i'm like yeah man you should come out you should film with us and he's like all right like i'll be there i'm like sure like all right cool you know and then a few like once i got owen locked in because i somehow landed on owen you know like because i he worked at wendell's and i knew him from that and i knew that he was a really really good filmer and so i was like owen Owen needs to be our guy and i like oh like it was the best decision i've ever made and so i literally like go in call owen owen says he's down oystein i could end up calling oystein and oystein's like all right i'll be there got a ticket from norway to redmond oregon <laughs> to fly in and he was going to stay with my parents for a few days and a hall was going to come like a week after us and so i picked up oystein from the airport owen drove in like a like a day before oystein got there and i i had got back to oregon i hadn't been in oregon for a while and i was so scared about them coming i was so petrified i mean one of my favorite skiers in the world is coming i got this filmer that i'm paying who's like down to do this and they're coming in my home like like they're coming to oregon for me to do something that i had no idea what to do you know like literally no idea i was i was just like i've never built a jump before type of thing you know so i actually went and i boot packed to the summit of mount bachelor by myself just to look for spots and try to find things didn't know what i was looking for but i was just so scared i like had to do it so went up there looked around for i mean it took me all day i, I there was snow all the way up to the mountain and like like the entire mountain i boot packed the whole thing in my ski boots it was like i didn't have skins or anything like i had no idea what i was doing and got up there and decided that i found like a little like a few little zones always time showed up we went up to the mountain like got a few clips it was we were really struggling in the beginning a hall came out like a week later we didn't even know if he was going to come out like we were like doubting if he was even going to come out 
he ended up coming out like he was kind of bummed in the beginning on it because he was just skiing all year and I think everyone was kind of fried but everyone wanted it you know and then we started building features and one thing went to another to another and we came up with magma and then we just stuck with it and so now I mean now I look at it I'm like why would I not make my year as busy as I can and why would I not go out and film like that's just that's a part of the whole ordeal yeah and that so that was your first big video that you that you made yeah yeah I mean yeah yeah that was like the first thing that I had really filmed Mm -hmm. and so what was your reaction to the final product because obviously it lit up the like it lit up new schoolers and people loved it were you thinking to yourself like damn like I need to do this every year. Like, this is the best feeling in the world. Like, this is like the skier I want to be. Um, it was crazy. I was actually in, I was in California visiting some of my family and Owen sent me the link and he's like, Hey man, like here's magma. And I was like, all right. So I clicked on it and literally he, he like made the video one time. I think there was like one thing that he changed about it. Like he played a song for a little longer and that was like really it like the 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 first thing he sent me was like our final thing like it literally like the kid killed it like there was nothing he could have done better and he he sent it to me and I watched it and I I was sitting there I was crying for sure you know like I was like oh my gosh like this is so cool you know because I mean it was, it was just like, it was like dream shit, you know, like you grow up, you want to, you, you have an idea of what you want in your head, you know? And like, and this wasn't like a final step or anything in, in that realm, but it was, it was like the first step in like the right direction to be able to like prove myself as a skier for, for me personally, you know, I watched it and I was just, I was so happy. I didn't know what people would think of it. You know, I had no real idea like what people would think of the whole video. And I'd watched it so many times by the time it like came out that I was just like, kind of like numb to the whole, you know, like, like, I mean, there was one, uh, we did a, a premiere in Salt Lake that I ended up setting up myself and like somehow whipped it out in like, that was something I was like so proud of in like five days or something just like got this premiere going got free drinks for everyone like got some skis to give away like we did it was right around Halloween the costume contest and all the premieres that we had done before that were kind of like not that impressive you know like that we did the first world premiere in France in Annecy um at this like at high five uh, the event um and it was like so underwhelming you know like we had uh, because they do it by cards so they play like six videos and it's like you like sit into this movie theater you know and so i mean everyone's watching it and they like almost they like almost didn't even know what they were really watching you know we were kind of in like more of like a big mountain like type of uh like screening so they were like they were stoked on it but it wasn't like what we expected you know so i was kind of like after that premiere, I was like, all right, it kind of flopped a little, you know, like that sucks. You know, I was, I was pretty, I I mean, it was cool, you know, like we had people hyping us up about it, but it wasn't like anywhere in the realm that I thought we would get, you know? And then I set up that premiere in Salt Lake and when like, when it like people were just losing their minds during the whole thing, they were so stoked on it. You know, we had all these kids come out and these people and everyone was having like a blast. And we filled up this room with so many people and kids I knew that I like grew up with were there, like watching it. Like it was so, so cool. And I think like one of the more memorable times for me of the entire thing was like, when when the ender drops and I do like the triple or whatever and everyone in that room like lost their minds I mean I like I I I literally was like I was crying like it was the coolest thing ever it was so cool like just that many people being so proud of something you spent so much time on and something you like idolized for so long you know and that was the moment for me when I was like all right like we made something that like all that work was worth it just for that moment yeah and owen's editing is just so good and it just makes you feel the whole thing yeah i mean he he made it remarkable you know and it's something that every year that goes by and i look back and i'm I'm, i watch it every like i don't know like maybe like i don't know every every few months or something you know four months or something 
I, I watch it and I'm so damn proud of it, you know, and I know that there's little things that I, I wish I like focused on a little more, you know, like, and I, and I'm learning more of that and that's becoming more th- like, like, uh, clear to me as I grow up, you know, just like how I want to ski and how I want to portray my skiing and things like that. But, um, I I'm so proud of that piece of work. Like that is the coolest thing to me. And it's, it's like so heart touching to just like see the impact that has on people and people say they watch it all the time and they appreciate it and they see the work that goes into it, you know, and they, they see it for what it is, you know, it's just, it's literally a film that was made for the absolute love of the sport and just for skiing and wanting to be better and better ourselves and just fucking do what we always grew up loving. You know, it wasn't about a sponsor. It wasn't about making money. We weren't going to make money off it and we knew it, you know, and it wasn't about any of that. It was like one of the very few things that I've been able to experience that was just for the love of, of what we were doing. So, I mean, it is an incredibly touching thing for me. Yeah. And I'm definitely one of those people that goes back and watches every couple months. Cause it's just, dude, it's just so good. That's it's just so, so good. <laughs> that's so sick. That makes me, that makes me stoked when people, when people come up and tell me that and stuff, I'm like, thank you. Like that, that is literally like that pays off every single thing, you know, every day of shit when we're, we're sleeping in our cars, you know, like every single day of just like taking hits and everything was all worth it for like just people being able to like, just utterly enjoy what we made. Yeah. And th- so I actually, uh, I did, uh, I interviewed Owen in a bunch of episodes back. I think it was okay. like number eight or so, yeah. or maybe even number six based on the new setup. But um, the fun, the thing that made me laugh the most is he was saying that you guys would sleep in until like noon or like one o'clock and then yeah. go out and film. I just thought that was so funny. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not early. You can't build with the snow when it's early, you know, like, you, I mean, it's all icy. It's terrible. I mean, we, it was, it, it, I mean, it's crazy to think back on, you know, cause I mean, we do similar stuff now, you know, it's like, Owen and I, when we were just in the hood, we were sleeping in the van and we would get up there like whenever we could and we'd ski all day and put in like insane amounts of work. Like it was insane, you know, but um, yeah, you, you, we would get up there at like 10, 11, maybe 12, you know, like figure out our pass situation, which most of the time we were just like trying to poach, you know, like, I mean, we would do some sketchy shit to get people up that lift you know and just we we needed people to help us you know and we needed to get people up and owen didn't have a pass that whole summer we were fortunate enough to get day passes um and we were just like just trying to make it work we had all types of issues you know people just like screaming at us like people not letting Owen on the lift um just like the whole ordeal was like so i mean there were so many things that we had to deal with you know i mean every single day it was something you knew like the snow wouldn't cooperate like something would melt out a little you know you had to go and there was rain days where we like we wouldn't go up and we didn't i mean when we built that quarter pipe we had to build that quarter pipe two times you know like we went up we built it i hit it two times just to test it out right before we went up and did that sunset shoot it was after we sessioned that two jump line so we hit the two jump line go down build a quarter pipe i test hit twice or three times or something felt sick went up did the sunset shoot left uh went back to or no it started raining a hall left for like two or three days i went back to ben for the fourth of july um because that was going to be like our time off owen went to hood river or something oystein went back to norway and the like the, we just had to wait for the rain you know we were sitting in ben waiting for the rain a hall came back we went back up the whole quarter pipe was gone it was a complete different hole like the whole thing there were so many rocks there we went we rebuilt it and we were able to hit it that day so there was there were so many things that went into that project that were just like they, they were so challenging and every single day i mean we would stay up there till nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, every single night, every single night, you know, you come down and you're dead. You're laying in that parking lot and nothing's felt better than just laying in the parking lot. Then you got to go down, you got to make food, you got to set up your camp and everything. You pass out, you wake up at like 10 and you do it all over again for a new shot. Like it's, it, it was insane. Yeah, that's amazing. And so I think that we have to talk about the behind the scenes with the triple. So like what was going through your mind with that triple and like setting up for it and and everything that led up to it um 
that one's funny because we were we were joking around about pretty much like the whole time we were filming you know like it was kind of just like oh like you're gonna do the triple flare or whatever you know like a qp triple like that would be so sick and i was like yeah 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 yeah. i want to do it i want to do it you know but you're always talking shit till it comes down to the actual moment and so we were always joking about it and i was the first day i hit it i uh, like when before the second build i kind of like i just did I was, I was just doing like some flares and stuff and i like like kind of like thought of it for a sec but it wasn't anything where i was like yep like that that'll go you know and oystown was like yo you think you can triple flare that like jokingly i'm like yeah 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 totally totally and i mean it was it was it was literally a joke and then we went up there that day and um i think that we we built it and started off just hitting it you know we were hitting it a bunch and i think i was just doing like some dub chucks you know like a dub flare or whatever and it, i really like at that point in time i was like there's like <laughs> i'm not gonna do this you know like it was not very lippy it would like you know you would deck on that on that like little shelf most times you would hit that and then like bounce down like it, it i mean it really and i you would not have much air time like you were just like like it was like it was cool but i at that moment it kind of like it, it, it wasn't even a real thought in my mind you know I was like oh whatever and so I just I kept doing them because I want like just doing the dub flare because I just wanted to get a better clip of it and all of a sudden I don't know if there was something that like set me off about it or what actually ended up happening but it was just kind of like yo you think I could you know and I talked to uh, Cameron Broderick who was up there and he was one of my buddies and he has like I think one clip or two clips I was like, I was like, yo, man, like, you think I could do this? Or maybe it was Lennon. Maybe I talked to Lennon. I was like, yo, man, you think I could do this? And he's like, no, like, <laughs> you got to go. If you, if you think you want to do it, you got to go way, way, way bigger. So I was like, okay, like, sure. So there was a point where everyone was starting. And so I just hiked up way further and just ended up coming in. And I did one dub flare that was like a little bigger, you know, like a little bigger than the other ones that I did. And I went to Owen and I was like, Owen, you think I could actually do the triple flare, you know? And he's like, he's like, you got to go way bigger. And I'm like, all right, all right, man. So I went up again and, and uh, this was after a hall did the, uh, the nose butter dub, dub 12 or whatever it was. Um, and cause, cause I thought about it a little bit before that I like was talking to Cam about it and then a hall wanted to do the nose butter and i brought it up to a hall and a hall it's like we're gonna have to make it kickier but let me land this first and then we'll rebuild it so i actually sat down for a little bit a hall landed his trick we go we rebuild it then i do one that was a little bit bigger owen's like i think you could do it but you do need to go bigger so i'm like all right word so i go up i hike up way further than i hiked up any of the other times and i was like kind of contemplating it at that point but i was like whatever and i did a dub flare it was big it was big as fuck it was huge you know i land and i was like and the whole time before that i was thinking about the triple you know i'm like worst comes to worst i'll just go to my back you know like I'll, i was like I, i'll i'll just go to my back like it won't hurt that bad right like i mean it'll suck you know but i'll survive type of thing you know um and i landed that dub flare where i went really big and oh my god i hit an ice vein in that landing it was so it was so sturdy and I was sitting there, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, if I go to my back, I'm not going to be okay. And I knew it right at that moment. And I didn't want to admit it to myself, you know. But I, I did know at that time that, I like, it, it was a serious ordeal. So I went down and landed. And Owen was right where we were landing. And I was, like, hugged Owen. I was like, all right, man. Um, hiked up. I hugged Alex and Cam because they were just at the bottom. Um and I started hiking up and Len was right in front of me and he spoke a few words to me and I hugged him and he went down and um, I hiked all the way up to this zone where I was dropping in and even beyond where I did the last one. And I'm sitting there in the, we, we had been filming for almost a, like two weeks at this point, like every single day. And we had never seen anyone else up on the mountain. Like we're kind of far over, you know, and like the boondock area you know like it was just like we're off like we're nowhere in like a normal place and i'm sitting there and i'm so scared you know like i'm i'm shitting myself like i'm so terrified 
I'm sitting there and I'm praying, you know, I'm like, Oh man, like, please protect me on this one. And I'm getting nervous and I'm looking up into the sky, just like kind of screaming, like trying to get myself excited. And out of nowhere, there's this guy that walks up. He's touring up the, the fucking mountain. He walks up and I'm seeing, and I was screaming at myself before this. Right. I'm like, what? I look over. I'm like, how's it going, man? And he's like, what's up? I'm like, not much. And he's like, going to do something gnarly. I'm like, I think. And he goes, get it. And then just kept walking. There was nothing else to it. I was like, all right, that's a sign right there. Like I better go. And I can't see anyone. I don't know what they're doing down there, you know, cause I'm on top of the knoll. And so I can't see the feature. I can't see anything I'm sitting there. And I just was on some, some shit. And I was just like, I, I understood. And this may sound dramatic, but at the time it was kind of where my head was at, but I was like, I understood that if, something happened you know and i i had something go down or i was i don't know worse like you know you die or something <laughs> like i mean it sounds dramatic but at the point you're you're contemplating a lot and i'm sitting there and if that went down i i understood the the risk and i cared about the reward so much more than that you know and so i i knew that and i acknowledged that and i told myself that and i i knew that it, it was kind of something at the time that was worth dying for. And so I dropped in and fucking skated my heart out and went over and rolled over the knoll. And I saw them all together, you know, just right at the zone where it was filmed and they were all right behind him, uh, like Owen. And I sat there and I fucking just threw really hard and realized I was going three. And next thing I know, I was on the ground. Like literally it was, it was just like that. Like I, I felt the third flip go over and I was like landed, don't remember like landing or bouncing or anything. I just remember like, it was such a peaceful, just like, you know, and just like rode out. And I was, didn't even recognize like what happened. And the only thing I could think of is my buddy Cam, he's running up to me and I'm trying to get my other ski off before he hugs me. And so I got my one ski off. And if you look in the video, I like clip my other ski off like so quick. I'm like, bah! and like clip it off. And he hugged me right when I got it off. And that was the only thing I thought about. And I mean, it, it was, it was insane. I stood there at the end and just like looked at it. And it was, I think like probably the most remarkable moment I've ever had on my skis or just in my life. Like it was, it was nuts. It was just like a moment when I faced fear in, in like the fullest in my, in my life, you know, like I, I'd never been that scared. I'd never been that nervous. And it, it, it wasn't for a crowd, you know, like wasn't for anything like that was just a moment that was like purely for me and myself and my skiing you know just to like push myself because that's what I wanted to do more than anything and so I fucking landed it we had a little moment where we were all standing there and everyone was just like wow like that was nuts that that went down and I'm sitting there afterwards I I, I landed it I sat there and a goes hunt like I know you just landed that but and he was hiking a little bit and he's like but I do think you need to get some other clips on this. Like all you guys, a dub player and a triple, like you may need to get another clip. And I'm like, all right, man, like sounds good. So I went up and I did like four or five, like switch dubs, like switch dub tens on it, landed it. And after that, we hiked out and got a, like a celebratory little cheeseburger and went to bed and went up the next day and just kept skiing. Oh, that's insane. I can't believe that that, that wasn't the finale. You know, well, <laughs> I, like, I can't believe we just didn't pack it up after that. No, it was, it was, and that, that was like a really cool thing to me. Cause it was like, like no matter what we did or like what we went through is just, it's, it's, you got to just keep getting clips. Like it was like, that was the reason we were out there. We weren't out there to like do that. And that was a really great moment. And it was something that I was, I will always hold on to, you know, and what the amount of time that we spent there idolize, like just being happy for what just happened was, was sick. It was so cool. And I wouldn't change that event for the world. You know, like I, it was literally me and like some of my best homies, you know, and we were on a mountain in the middle of nowhere with no one around us. And like that shit just went down, you know, and no one was going to know about it for months. Like that was just the reality of the situation. I couldn't brag. Like I couldn't show the clip to anyone. I couldn't do anything. I, it was literally just this like remarkable little thing where it happened. It was like, just like one of the coolest moments I was able to experience. And we just had to keep skiing, you know, like it was all for the video. Like we wanted the video to 
turn out the best it possibly could. So we kept skiing. And I think that really shows to like a hall's mentality and my, my willingness to like follow that mentality and try to uh, emulate him, you know, is that like, fuck, like it doesn't matter, but like, we just, we, we want to just ski like skiing. It's all for skiing. So we just want to ski. And that's, that's what we came out to do. That is beautiful. That is just so, that is so sick. And so, um, so just after that moment, you know, like, cause it's on camera, the celebration, it's just, that is like the most powerful shot in the whole movie. What was it like right after when you run up to Owen and you're like, yo, let me see that. Like when you actually saw the shot. It was crazy. I don't even think I really recognized like the clip for what it was, you know, like it was like, we reckon like it was just so perfect, you know, like it was just like the clip was filmed so perfect. And I was so scared because I was like, what if he didn't really get it, you know? And like, like that was my biggest worry, you know, like maybe he like missed it or something. And I watch and I see that I land and I bounce like 15 feet and you can see my tracks. Like we look at my tracks and there was actually a dirt pile in the landing and a hall had been watching me do the dubs. And so he knew if I went really big, I would travel a little bit more. And so he actually took like two or three shovelfuls to this rock patch that was there. And he actually covered up what I landed on when I bounced. So I bounce and then I land and I land on this rock pile that would have been exposed if a hall didn't cover it. And so they ended up covering it and it was, it was literally like perfect. Like we're sitting there and we watched the video and we all were just like, no way. Like it for, I mean, we didn't watch it for a little bit cause we're, we were all just like, kind of like, no way. Like that was so cool, you know? And, and they're all like hyping me up and it was, it was sick. And, but we're, we're sitting there just looking at the feature and we're talking about my bounce because my bounce was so much. Like I, I landed on this bul- like bulge and just like bounced off this cliff. And just like, we were just like, oh my gosh, like, no way. And then we looked at the clip and well, I mean, I could like, it was just at the time it was just like perfect. Like it was just like, you got the clip, man. And it was so cool with like the celebration afterwards, you know, it was just insane. Like it was like, you, you couldn't want a better video, you know? And that night when we like ate some food at uh, the Huckleberry Inn, it's like the classic Gubby spot. Um, we were just like sitting there and we were, played the video and we were like all like huddling around it trying to like not let anyone see it it's like 10 or 11 o'clock like anyone's gonna care you know and we're just like huddled around the thing and we watched it a few times and we were just like no way like that was so like that's so like then from there at least in my eyes like the video was it had like something to it you know like there was something like behind the video you know like not saying I made the video in any shape you know like it, it, it was a hall killed it so hard Owen killed it so like it's it the whole thing is just a huge group effort like no one would be able to do it by themselves but um that was like just when we started getting those clips because a halt's nose butter too was something that we watched and it was insane you know like that trick is fucking crazy like it he literally like barely fit his skis in the track because we didn't make the lip wide enough and he just like bounced off and did this dubbed well like it was so nuts and like so snappy and like clean and we were like after we got those clips we're like all right the the video has something here like we we gotta keep doing what we're doing you know so it kind of just added a little bit more fire to the whole project and i mean it it, it, i think we started to realize that it was like a serious video at that point yeah that is that is so crazy i mean and then obviously you go on and win trick of the year for that and was that just like the cherry on top like you actually like get to take home like a physical manifestation of how sick that was yeah no i mean it was it was so sick i mean it's that event was so far past like we were already talking about maybe filming another and and there was like so many things that went on in that amount of time and uh, i mean magma was just like all all the things that we thought would happen from it had already like kind of happened and then new schoolers tells us about this event and we're like wow like sounds sick like i mean it was something that we really were hoping for you know and something like that like just like i don't know just something in that realm and we went out there and we ended up just like i mean we had like four skis like a hole one skier of the year i got trick of the year and then the video got two uh awards you know so it was like we had four skis and my parents were there that night and like it was just it was so cool it was such a cool night just to like be able to sit there with Owen who worked so hard on it and Alex who 
worked so hard on it, you know, and we're all sitting there and we were, I don't know, just, it, it was just, it, that was like a real moment where uh, I felt that like, um, just like all the work that we had put in for so long for this was really, and, and I felt it in so many ways before, you know, but it was just like, dude, you get these awards, like people are so proud and like stoked and you're able to kind of like make your, like my parents, I mean, it's hard for them to realize like what this shit's all about, you know, but they're able to be like, oh, like, wow, this is cool. You know, like pre people appreciate it, you know, and they're able to see something like come out of it, you know, in that realm. And to just have like those things and something that we'll have forever. It was, it was, that night was so sick. Yeah. I mean, it must've been cool for your parents. Cause you like, you don't see shit like that in soccer. <laughs> no, not at all. So they were, they were stoked. And, and I mean, my parents are so supportive. Like, I mean, dude, after that, I would walk in and my dad loves watching videos like of me doing whatever. And he was, it, he has watched that video all the time he, he has this like a uh, desktop computer and he just sits on with his headphones he sits like super close to the computer and he he just watches it all the time you know and that was cool for me because it was like I mean my parents don't get to be up there every day with me you know they don't get to watch me train or like do like see like how I'm progressing and things like that so for me to have this like thing that represented me and my skiing and was able to prove myself a bit because that was a big piece of it you know I, I wanted to prove myself and like how confident I was in myself as a skier like that was like a big point of the movie was like for me personally I'm not saying that's why we made it it was just like I wanted to have something to show the world like I'm not just like some kid you know like I want like this is some shit like I want to I want to be able to prove like I want to ski hard and I, I can keep up you know and so to have that and to, for my parents to be able to enjoy that for my family members, you know, I had family in New York be able to see it and they're able to show like all my little cousins and, and just like the general public and to be able to just express that and they're able to get a feeling of what we're doing and why I do this and why we love it so much. And they're able to understand that just for those 11 minutes or whatever it is, but they're able to feel that like that, the whole video was just like, it, 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 that was one of the best things I'd ever like, and still like, I think it was one of the best decisions besides just getting Owen for the video was like the best decision I've ever made was to try to make that video, you know, and to have guys like that, like back the whole thing and take it in and make it their own, you know? And, and I mean, it wasn't, it's never a me thing. It was a us thing, you know, like Owen, worked so damn hard and a hall worked so damn hard and to have that crew and those guys i wouldn't be able to ever like pick a better group so i mean the whole thing is really really cool that's so sick that is yeah. so sick so one of the things that i wondered from this story where's the oystein footage from the first magma um he dropped an edit i forget what it was called it was like hood or, or I, I forget what he called it but he dropped a video from that um and he put it out on his own channel and like did his own thing and oyster was someone that we really really wanted to be in magma like we really wanted him to be a part of it um and when i originally talked to him on the trailer for park city he sounded like he was really into it you know it sounded like it was like a a, a cool thing and he wanted to do it so we planned on doing it and right before he bought his ticket to fly out he told me that he didn't want to be in the video that he was filming for his own project that he had going on that year and if he and that kind of did put us in a little bit of a bind because we were i mean filming for three people is a lot easier than filming for two just like it, you know like it, it, you got more footage it's just going to make the whole thing easier oystein's like oystein you know <laughs> like he like is like one of the best in the world you know so it's like I, I, we were we were really hoping for that footage you know and he wanted to film his own thing so we were kind of reluctant with it or at least I was and I I was a little bummed in the beginning but I was like you know dude like having you here is going to be just way more like beneficial you know we need to we need a bigger crew digging I want to I want to like bring like I want you to ski with us like get us stoked and you can have the shots at the end of it like he was going to be with us and build with us and split split paying with owen and like it was 
it was good for all of us. So we were like, yeah, you know, like, fuck it, like come out. So he came out and we knew that the whole time. And he ended up leaving before the quarter pipe session. It was actually just supposed to be him and I at the quarter pipe session because a hall was leaving, but then the rain came in and it wasn't him and I, it was a hall and I, um, and so, uh, uh he got a lot of really good shots that we were like really stoked on and he's kept them for his own shit um after magma came out he was kind of just like damn i wish i was a part of that you know because i mean i think he understood at that time like what we were actually making and i think he got more shots for his own project than he like really like anticipated in the beginning or something um and so when we were talking about filming for Magma 2, we were going to go to Europe and we were going to be in Europe and Oystein was going to be uh, a part of it. And he was going to be in Magma 2 and it was going to be a hall Oystein and I. And that was what our plan was, was for that crew. Um, and so we talked to Oystein about it. We were planning tr like all the trips and everything and getting him all set. And um, we got it all together. And I think it was like, two or three days before I was, or like, yeah, it was like a week or something before I was supposed to fly to Europe to like start filming. Cause we were going to film for like a month or two until Kimbo. So we were like really preparing for the whole thing. It was going to be a hall always done and I, and we got a little bit of money at that point for, for it and everything. And we were stoked. And then the pandemic hit, um, things changed really, really, really quickly a hall was in Europe already. And so he like, it was when we weren't sure about flights going out or like coming back and, and uh, they were blocking flights coming back into the U S. So a hall got like what we thought was going to be like one of the last flights back into the U S. So he got that. Oystein was just stuck in Norway, unfortunately. And we were in Colorado and we were kind of trying to figure out where we were going to go. If we were going to go back to hood, if we were going to go, to like somewhere in Idaho or Montana. And we were talking about a bunch of different ideas and a hall, his family has a cabin up in uh, big cottonwood in Utah. And I was already in Utah and always, uh, and Owen was already in Utah. And so he just started going out and scoping and he's like, dude, there's a lot of snow here for what it is right now. Like I, I think we can find some spots. So it just started a full ordeal and we just ended up starting to film Magma 2 in, in uh, Utah. And it, it, it just so happened that Oystein wasn't able to be a part of it because of that. And we were so bummed on that. Like, I mean, I've always wanted Oystein to be a part of it or to film more with Oystein. And he, we, like, we love Oystein. Like, he's literally a part of our crew, you know? But um, he wasn't able to make it out for that and wasn't uh, a part of Magma. So that's just kind of how it all went down. Yeah. And uh, so what was the energy coming into to, to Magma 2? Like, were, were, what were you guys, or not the energy, but like, what was the expectation? You're like, okay, we're going to match like the same hype. We're going to do something the same or better. Or you're like, okay, like we're just doing, we're just doing something again. It doesn't matter if it's completely different, but we just want to do something. Yeah. Um, I think we were, we, we just wanted to make it better. Like that was our whole idea. It, like we, we just wanted to, I mean, for us, it's not like the video like we had no idea what the video was going to come out like, you know, but we just wanted to ski better, you know, like we knew we had more to offer a hall and I are, I mean, we, we, we were consistently getting better. And so we, we just really wanted to make it better than the first one. You know, that was our goal. And we know, we knew that we're, we were never going to be able to replace the first one because the first one was such like a natural feel, you know, like that's just what the video had to it, you know, but we just wanted to, try to outdo it a little bit in whatever way we could so we just started building jumps and magma 2 was a lot more work because uh when we were filming for magma we would take the chairlift up to a certain point you would like traverse over we would have to hike out of whatever we we're hitting which was a pain and and it was a lot of building and you're up on the glacier all day you know you're just getting fried by the sun like it's it was a ton of, of labor, don't get me wrong, but Magma 2 was like, we had to tour or hike up to these zones that were 30, 45 minutes, right? And that's how you start. Then you go, you have to build, which is like pretty like, it, it's a big demand, you know? And then you have to hike the feature and hit it. So in Magma, we were able to 
hit, build, hit, and get all the clips we want to in a day. Like that's something we're like we would normally be able to do. Um, for Magma Two, we would have build days. So Alex and I would go up every other day, go up and build a feature. If we were able to convince someone else to come with us, they would come with us. You know, um, if not, it was just Alex and I, and we would go up and we would build just for a full day just have a full day of building and then ride down hike up the next day finish it up with people because you have a feature that they can hit you know and they'll come out and hit or watch us hit it um they'll help finish it up we'll finish it up and we would session it that day so it, it, every feature was like a a two-day process so it was a it was a lot more for that and a lot more work kind of went into that and after that one i was we filmed for a little longer and we had, we counted how many features that we had in the first one. I think it was like, I forget, it was like 13 or 14 features that we had made. And so we were counting for this one and we got to, I think we had 19 or something like that. So we were able to get to that many features and we knew that we had a pretty good project for that point. And we had some pretty decent shots and we had goals for what we wanted. Um, and we were able to kind of check off some boxes and we made it. And then with the intro, I had the, uh, that idea for like three or yeah, like three years or four years, maybe um, just kind of like messing around with some old, like classic ski footage. Cause that is like a really big part of me now is that classic ski footage. And so um, we, I had that idea for a, a while. I mean, but getting Tom and Dumont in on something is not an easy task. <laughs> so I wanted to do that for the first one and we weren't able to, I, we didn't really even try. And so for the second one, I was, I was like, we should do this. Like we should really try this. And so um, a hall was talking to Tom a little bit and then he just passed it over to me and he's like, talk to him. And so I talked to Tom and Tom was kind of the, <laughs> the plug to talk to Dumont, you know, like Dumont is a hard man to get a hold of. And so I, and I didn't know Dumont at all. I knew Tom like, okay, but I didn't know Dumont like at all. I'd met him one time, I think. Um, and I doubted those, like I knew Tom knew about Magma, but I don't think Dumont did, you know? So um, it, it was, it was a hard thing to swing to him, but um, Tom helped us out a ton and was really, really cool with like hooking us up with, with getting a hold of Dumont. And so he ended up, calling Dumont a, a few times and talking to him about it and he was like hey man so what you got to do and he's, it was Tom to me and he goes you got you got to call Dumont he's really bad at texting you got to call Dumont so fucking Tom Walsh is telling me to call Simon Dumont <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm shitting myself I'm like oh man like I gotta call the man you know like I mean Dumont is Dumont you know <laughs> like this is the guy that you grew up idolizing this is the guy that was bigger than anything else you know like he was he he was so out of the realm of even skiing you know like when we were growing up like I looked up to Bobby all the time but Dumont was he was the biggest star ever you know like the classic red and white kit you know like everything so I end up I called Dumont doesn't answer oh my god oh god like do I leave him a voicemail? So I leave him a voicemail, no response. I text him, no response. I hit up Tom because I'm trying to figure out where I can get a church, when I can get Alex there, when I can get Tom there, when I can get Dumont there, and when we can get Owen there in a church that we can do this in. And it's a global pandemic. Like it, it, I, it, churches weren't happening. Nothing's going on. I'm like, oh man, I really don't know about this. I was staying with this guy and he goes, hey, I know a pastor. So I, I was calling every church I could possibly find every single one, one either didn't answer or they want some money, you know, and we didn't have money and, you know, so we're, we're kind of screwed. So um, I find this, this pastor in uh, uh, Park City and he was just a super kind guy and he goes, sounds cool, man. How, uh, yeah, come in, like you, you can do it. Um, but yeah, just come in, like, tell me when you need. So I'm trying to set up this time and I still don't know if we have Dumont in on it and it wouldn't really make sense if we just had Tom, you know? So I'm like, I'm like, Oh God, I got to figure this out. So I texted Dumont again and I hit up Tom and I still, had, this is like three days after I tried to call Dumont the first time. And Tom's like, you gotta, 
uh, I talked to him. He sounds like relatively interested, but you got to explain it to him. I'm like, all right, well, he's not answering. So called him, didn't answer, left him another voicemail, no response. So I'm chilling, trying to figure it out. I'm sitting in the basement of this guy's house and all of a sudden my phone rings and I had his number saved on my phone and it just says Simon Dumont. And I was like, no way. And I am so scared. And so I answered the phone. I'm like, hello. He goes, Hey, is this Hunter? I go, yep. And he goes, Hey Hunter, this is Simon Dumont <laughs> like that. And I'm like, uh, what up Simon Dumont? How are you, man? <laughs> and so I explained to him magma. I did a horrible job on the phone trying to talk to him about it. I was just rambling and just jumping all over the place and he goes okay uh, okay like interrupts me halfway through i'm like uh, and i'm so scared i'm like uh, oh man oh man like what did i say and he's like just tell me like when i need to be there and where i need to be and i'll try to be there and i was like okay man like sounds good so figured out a time with the church figured out a time with uh tom and then asked you if he could be there and they ended up, we like set them up so that they would come in like 15 minutes or 20 minutes after us. Cause we only had like an hour where we could have the church. Um, and so um, we filmed as much as we could before they showed just to try to get like comfortable. And we had to set up the seating and everything. Um, and we filmed that. And then here come Tom and Simon walking in and they were super cool about it. Like really, really, really like the fact that they did that was huge for us like it was it was so like just some stuff that they really didn't have to do at all you know and they could have just looked at it as, as just like a wash of an idea you know but they 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 did it out of like the grace of their hearts you know and it was it was a really kind thing for them to do and they hooked it up for us and uh, I'm really grateful that they did that and so we were able to film it and we made it happen and it was really really cool and we originally put all the footage together and Owen sent it to me and it didn't work at all <laughs> it didn't our acting was so bad and it did not work at all like not even in the slightest and and I'm like oh no like we may not be able to use this footage you know so we ended up cutting out some of like some parts where a hall and I were like running away in one part or, and our acting was really bad. And so we cut out some parts and then there was one more clip of, I think Dumont said something else or Tom said something else. And so we had to cut that and we put it together and it worked pretty well. And so we were like, wow, this is cool. So let's put it in. So we put it in and over like the next, once we finished up the video, um, I was able to show some people, you know, I show, I was in Switzerland for a training camp. I was able to show Oystein and I was like, check this out. And right after he saw the intro, he, cause in the beginning, it kind of looks like we're just like doing a terrible recreation of this fucking iconic video, you know? Uh, but after that, they, uh, when he, when he saw Dumont and Tom, or Tom and Dumont walk in, he was like, there's no way you did that. Like, there is no way that worked. And I was like, we did it, man. And he was like, that is so cool. So it was, that was, that was really cool for me. Cause I just had that kind of envision for a really long time. And those guys really made it happen. And that was just like a really cool homage to like, pay to that video and what kind of skiing was for me growing up. And I think a lot of people. Well, I mean, it's so sick. Cause it's like, it's almost like the, you incorporated like the inspiration into a an, almost like a remake of the video like it's you and a hall and then that older video it was tom and 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 simon so it was just like so sick like the two worlds colliding that like it was just so awesome that's cool i'm glad i'm glad you liked it i was it was scary for us for sure you know like i mean you have this great video you know you just filmed so long for it and then you go out on the limb and decide that you want to put an acting scene in it, you know, with a bunch of guys who aren't good in front of a camera talking. So it was, it was nerve wracking, but um, it, it was, it was fun. And that's like, we just, we wanted to make the video fun. We wanted to make it cool and enjoyable for people to watch and sit down and kind of give some personality and some like inspiration and definitely just like show that that's, that's where we came from, you know, is like, those dudes, you know, inspiring us for a super long time. And so th th those were like the guys. So uh, I, it was just really cool for us. Yeah. And so another, uh, I mean, you, you hopped right in and, and, and asked and answered the question that I was going to ask anyways, because I really wanted to know about the intro. But the other thing I was wondering about um, the second magma is uh, there's a lot of trees and um, 
and I asked Owen about it because he almost got impaled by one. But there's a shot of you, and he yeah. brought this up to me that I didn't even and I didn't even notice on the first watch. Like you literally almost just took it like straight through th- straight through your stomach. So what happened with that that uh, shot? <laughs> that was a stupid idea. <laughs> that was just a really dumb one. We were uh, what were we even fucking doing? Oh, we had a we had a jump that we wanted to hit, and that was going to be where the in run was was right in the landing of that and um a hall had a few more shots than i did at that time and so i was kind of like like feeding for a shot you know like i I wanted to get clips um i needed to catch up a little bit and so we were talking about and they're like what if you smash through this tree and i'm like all right they're like we got to take it out anyway you know it's it's in the in run for this it's this dead tree we're we're not cutting down real trees like uh, living trees and so we're uh we uh we're like we gotta get it out of here so like if if you want to hit it we should build a lip really quick and you should hit it so we're like all right and it's just a hall owen and i was literally just supposed to be build day so um we whip up this lip really quick you know and my original idea was i would i would go like switch 630 into it you know and smash and then go switch sev um and so I skied into a few times and you only get one hit, you know, like, it's like, it's like a one and done type of thing. And, uh, and, uh, I, I tried to hit switch just like to the side, you know, cause you would see that landing and, uh, I, I tried to do it. And like the first time I literally missed the entire lip on the jump, like skied switch into the, like the bushes on the side, you know? And so I was like, I was like, whoa, I, I don't know if I can do this. And I tried again and barely made it off the lip. I was like, guys, I don't know if this is going to work. So they're like, well, what else can you do? And I was like, I could, I could probably do like a cork, like four into it, you know? And so they're like, all right, like that would, that would be sick. So I went up and I did a straight air. And after that first straight air, I realized how small the landing was. It was this tiny, quick transition of a landing, you know, it was steep and just short. I was like, oh, this is feeling sketchy, but uh we'll we'll i'll go up and just hit it again so i hit it again it felt a little better and then i was like all right oh and like i mean i can't just keep hitting this thing to the side i'll i'll hit it like i'll I'll hit the tree so he was like all right sounds good and uh i was sitting up there and it was a it's a really weird concept to know that you're gonna like hit something before you hit the landing you know like you gotta like know your rotation in the air and then you also have to be like pretty like straight on with with the thing you know and we were scared because i didn't know if it was going to actually break you know if the tree doesn't break like what what's going to happen to me so we sawed it a little bit at the base of the snow where we could see it we just like cut into it like a little but we didn't want to cut into it too much because if the tree goes down then the clip's done you know like there's no point so we cut it a little bit and they thought it was good. And so I was like, all right. And so I'm sitting up there. I'm scared. I was scared for that cliff. Um, I was just going straight at this tree, but I was like, it would be sick if I, I just imagined it breaking in two places and I like fly through it, you know, type of thing. And I was like, that would be so rad, you know, like that would be, that would be a really cool shot. So I go up and I'm do a cork five and I hit the tree and I felt the tree hit and I knew I was like, I hit in the right place, but it was like, it was so much that went on in like such a small amount of time. I hit the tree and you hit it and you're like, and then, and then I realized that I rotated too much, you know? So I rotate too much. And then I go back and I smash my head on the snow, you know, cause I, I, I it's like land sideways on my back. And then I feel this thing just like rock me in the body, you know, like just like right in like the center of my belly you know just like hit me so hard and i'm like and then it collapses on me and i'm like i like roll out of it and i'm like all over the place it was like the most hectic crash i've ever had you know like you got this tree falling on you like it was so nuts and so i was uh i i i I laid there and i got up and i'm like i don't know if i'm good you know like and my shirt is all ripped i got these cuts on my stomach like these big cuts and bleeding um uh my helmet was just like full of snow i threw it off and uh it was it was just like a crazy thing that went down i had to get the tree off me and like kind of maneuver myself out and i was just i was hurting after that i was just 
I was really bummed out and I, I definitely cranked my head a little bit and I was just, I was all over the place. So after that, we watched the clip and I was like, dude, I literally, I got fucked up. And I think what happened was I was at an angle like this and the tree came down and then my belly went kind of to the side, you know? And so it like, luckily just like skimmed and like just scraped me. And then the majority of the impact went right next to me, you know, like it definitely hit me but not with all the force. Like, I think if it, I would have been like a, a, like an actual kebab, if it, if it landed like directly on me, like I would have been skewered, like it would have been insane. So I was, uh, I was pretty fortunate for how it all went down. And I, I left that day and they, they built a little bit of this, of the, um, that jump through the trees that A-Hall does the dub Misty on. Um, which was the jump that we were trying to build. And so the next day we went up and started to build it more. Um, I don't think we finished it that day. And then we came up after that and built it. And I was just trying to kangaroo on this jump and just got so bodied, it wasn't even funny. So it was like, it went from me getting like impaled by this tree to then trying to get more clips. And I just get absolutely bodied on this jump, like smash my face into my knee, like, tumble down this landing I could not get it and I was just having a little freak out moment you know just like god like I just want to get this trick and I need clips right now you know like a hall has a bunch of clips and I, I need better shots and so uh like than what I had you know and so I was just trying to get footage and I couldn't so I went like four or five days without getting a clip you know so it was definitely like pretty nerve wracking, you know, and in a, in a bummer. So I was just kind of tripping out about that. So that, that was like three days. I was so pissed off. I was just so bummed out, but then we like came back and ended up getting more shots. So it was cool. Yeah. And do moments like that, like where you just like can't land anything, does that, does that like get in your head going forward? Because I feel um, like it's, it's such a mental game, especially like, you know, you're just taking bail after bail after bail. Is that, are you starting to think like, damn mate, like maybe I'm not that good or, or what? <laughs> are you talking about like, like mental, like in the means of, of uh, the trick or your skiing? Sorry. Yeah. Like it, like it just in your confidence level, really. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, definitely hits, you know, you, you get pretty frustrated and you're like, I suck, you know, <laughs> like I can't do these things and I just suck. And there's some that get at you more like the one with the tree didn't really eat at me. It was more of just. I was really, really bummed out. I took that slam, you know, because it, it was just something like I didn't need to go and smash through that tree. Like it was, it's a pretty far off idea. And um, like it, it, it did not work well, you know? And so that was one that I could have avoided and just saved myself just like the pain of that one. Um, but then when I was doing the kangaroo, I like could not figure it out for the life of me. And I was just having so many issues and it was a good, it was a big jump. So it looked cool, you know? Um, and it was, it definitely was frustrating, but I mean, once you kind of get back on and you, you're, you're, you're a little bit hungrier for it, you know, um, then I would go and I, I was able to get some clips. So it was, it was good once I got that, but they, it does play with you a little bit for sure. Like your, your mental state definitely fluctuates quite a bit when you're in that area. Oh Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And the, the other, the other two, I just, I, I watched, I watched it again super late last night yeah. and I wrote down some uh, clips that stood out to me. Uh, so the funny one that stood out to me was the, the QP zero spin where you just yeah. like really tweak the skis. <laughs> what, what was good with that? Were you just joking around or like, what was going on with that? Um, I'd watched a bunch of clips of Sage Kotzenberg and he did this, it's like during this, uh, sunset shoot in Norway, I, I forget what the place is called. Um, but for this monster video and he does a shout out to Pep Fuhas who does the same 180 or the, like the same like trick where he kicks his arms back and like lets his board out, like, like strains his legs a bit and it looked really sick. And so a few years before that um or before like like uh, before magma 2 i had done some air to fakies like just like little ones you know um and done that tr like done that you know because i wanted to kind of find the skiing version of that so i would i would do that and uh um or sorry it wasn't pep who was it was not a skier sorry i'm thinking back to what i said he didn't get uh inspiration from pep he got inspiration from um 
Oh, I'm blanking on the guy's name right now. That's going to eat me alive. I forget his name. But another snowboarder, like one of the uh, Gigi, Gigi Ruff. And so he got inspiration from him and then Sage did it. And so I got inspiration from Sage. And uh, I, I, we were just like talking that day. And I was like, and we were trying to figure out tricks. And I was like, dude, if I just blast a big old air to fakey, like all styled out, I think it could be a kind of cool clip. And so I did one the end of the first day that we hit that quarter pipe and we ended up hitting that quarter pipe two days because it was just such a fun feature and really trickable um so I did one it was kind of the ice and it wasn't that cool of a clip like Owen filmed it with a fish eye and it was like not that great and I didn't go super big and it like wasn't super sick and then the next day I was like oh like I, I, I kind of want to try that again like that would be a cool clip to get and so I went up and just did it like three times or something and got got that shot and it's, actually one of my like favorite clips I've gotten like uh, like in a little while like it's it's kind of cool like just like how like punctual it is and I kind of like just like that I was able to like kind of add my own flavor to it so it was a snowboard inspired trick but it was uh, that trick I'm pretty I, I like it it's fun yeah I, I love that clip and I think that like Owen did a really good job presenting it too yeah no he definitely did with the music dropping and the the way he filmed it was it was really cool so I, I, I like that shot and that trick's mad fun actually you can just like see quite a bit with it so it was it was cool yeah and then the the last trick that stood out to me was the um I don't even know what you'd call it it was like the hand plant revert on the tree yeah. where you kind of yeah. like you redirect your spin in the air that so what, what went into that because I feel like that takes a lot of strength to like and grip on on something that's not super like easy to grab with like mittens on yeah. so what was going on with that um that trick was mad hard <laughs> that trick took like all day long it was that trick i think took me the longest out of any trick that we got for the whole movie for one and or two like it took me so long to do that trick um and i i had talked about it because i mean we're, we were trying to come up with trick ideas and i was like damn it would be really sick to hand plant a tree like that would be dope and i was thinking just like if you could just do like an actual really cool hand plant like grab and just like go back to like normal you know like like regular um and so i was like um i was like damn that'd be really sick and i don't like the way a lot of people hand plant on skis like where they like jump forward and put their hand in front of them type of shit i i'm not a fan of that <laughs> and so i was like i've never really seen like a like a dope hand plant like in a in a video like i think it would be sick you know so i uh I was like, word, like that would be cool. So then we built this feature and I was really, really scared to hand plant a tree. You know, like you miss your hand, you're screwed. And I'm not very good at hand plants as much as I would like to be. It just, whenever I try them, it just takes me a really long time and they're really weird on skis. And so um, I was like, well, like, let's see. And Lupe, uh, he ended up coming up and he was sessioning and he ended up doing just like a hand plant. I think it was right before me. And so I saw him do it. And I was like, fuck, like, all right, he made it look pretty chill. So then I, I did one and it was, it was scary, but it was pretty mellow. And then for, for him and I, it was kind of like, see who could go the biggest type of thing. <laughs> so then we just kept trying to go bigger and bigger. And um, he was a lot better at him than I was. I'm, I, I was really not that good at that trick. And so I, get, I just kept trying and I would, I would get so sketchy. Like I would fly to the side or like, like miss my hand or like drag my hand all the way up. And just like, I had all these like uh, wood chip cuts in my arm from it. Like it, it was insane. My, my gloves were like so destroyed. And so I always kept trying and trying and trying and all day and I'm freaking out. Like there was like a few people there that came and they're, they weren't normally there. And sometimes I really lose my mind when I film, I just scream and just lose it. You know, I'm just like, fuck, like, oh, this sucks. And that day I had a lot of little freak outs. <laughs> and so um, these poor people are sitting there watching me freak out at this tree and every, like all the other people besides, I think, who was up there? Maybe Lennon and Alex, and then Alex's girlfriend and Owen. Like everyone else had left at that point. So we're just sitting there, and I was just hiking, and I'm kind of trying to figure it out because Lupe has got me beat on the hand plant, and he got a lot of sick shots of it. And I was just like, what do I do? And so that was kind of a discussion. And then one just kind of ended up 
like going that direction, you know, and just like I popped out and I knew I could go that way. So I just went and I was like, oh, that'd be cool. And so I think Alex was just like, yeah, I think that's what you should do. So then I went up and I tried it like probably like four or five or maybe more times, like going where I went to switch. And I ended up landing it one time and I land and smash my face on my knee, but like save it. I was like this, like the whole time. And I ended up landing in this like rock hole that was right at the top of the landing that we like filled in. But it was such a big, like, like divot at that point that it like really affected me, but I was so tired. I was just like, dude, I'm, I'm going to take it. You know, like, I was like, I don't want to do this trick anymore. <laughs> you know, I was, I was so over it. I was, I, literally had had hiked that thing all day and when you do one trick over and over again it's more of just like a mental game you know because you're just like you're overthinking the trick you're overthinking like how much speed you need to take in like like I come up with these little things that I've done every time you know like oh I pop my skis on a certain way so I need like the last attempt was good so I need to pop my skis on that same way right or I touch this branch so I need to touch that branch again you know like I I come up I I just go through these weird mental games the whole time. And so when you're doing a trick for that long, you come up with so many that it, 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 you overthink the whole thing. And sometimes it just ends up not working out. So I'm sitting there touching branches and popping my skis on the same way every time. And I went into that one and, or, or sorry, I, I landed that one and I was in the pothole and I was like, I'm going to take the clip because Owen showed it to me. And it was so hideous, like so hideous. But I was like, fuck it, I'm tired. Like, I'll just take it. It was it was kind of cool, you know? And A-Hall was like, dude, you sure you don't want another? And I'm like, do you really think I need to go up that up there and like do it again? And that's where it really comes in handy that someone's there like that, that knows you better than you know you at some points, you know? And he's like, you're not going to be happy with that. Like, you should go up and do it again. I'm like, all right. And the sun was going down. And he's like, you got to rush. So ran back up there put my skis on. And I think it was that next time, or maybe I did one kind of messed up and then went up and then did it again. But I got that. And it was like, so rewarding. I was like, Oh my gosh, like, fuck this through my helmet, like through my gloves. I was so over it, like laid there for a while. I was just dead. My shirt was soaking. My gloves were literally like they dyed my hands black because they were so wet. Like it was so bad. And I was just like, fuck this. It's like, I'm so happy I got that. And we looked at the clip and it was actually pretty cool. So that was also like, I would say the air to fakie, uh, that hand plant. And I think those were, and the um, my switch alley-oop dub on that quarter pipe. Those were like probably my favorite clips I got for the whole movie. So that was I like uh, that hand plant was really high in my ranking and it took me all day long, but it was a really cool clip. And I was, I was really, really stoked on that one. Yeah. I mean, it's just so it's crazy. Like you're looking at the first movie and you got, and you get the triple like first try, but then you, then you're trying to just do a hand plant on a tree and it's take, it's like kicking your ass. All day. And that was something that like for the second one was really prevalent was that, I mean, the first one, Alex and I like landed everything like first or second try, like, it wasn't hard, you know, like, I mean, we got sketchy for sure, but we just did things that we were good at, you know, and just like pushed it a little bit further and they were on gnarly features, but we just did that for the second one. We were like trying our ass off, to like create something new. And, and, and when you're not in like the same realm, but you're trying to make it like work, it's, it was so hard. I mean, there was days where we would work like so long for a clip you know and that was almost every day for magma 2 but the first one was just like came to us you know so it was definitely a big difference between one and two yeah and so you mentioned that like um that there are a bunch of like extra people i mean there's a whole very nice friend section of magma 2 yeah. so was that a result of you know people were stoked on the first one and they're like let me get on the second one or is it like a bunch of people in salt lake it's covid nothing else to do like, well, how did that come come to be? I think it was kind of a mixture of the two things. You know, like, I mean, the first one had good recognition and, you know, you kind of get some respect and people realize like what it is, you know, and who wouldn't want to be like, or like have a little part of that, you know, and like be able to go out and watch or, or be like in that, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, if you're a skier, that sounds pretty cool. And it's just like, we're just homies with a bunch of like, 
those dudes. And so it's like, well, I like, I'm either sitting here doing nothing because it's COVID and I have nothing to do, or I'm going to go out and I'm going to ski with my homies and help them and film with them and hit this jump that like, it, it's going to be a pretty good jump because they made it, you know? So it was like, it was like, well, I mean, I think most people, you know, and, and it would take that, but I mean, you can't get people going out every day because they're going to be exhausted and over it. And that was like, we had not as many people want to come out on build days and help us because it was just, you know, they, they do have better things to do, you know, <laughs> like we didn't. So they, they, uh, yeah, I think, I think it was a combination of the two, you know, like you get to hit these cool features if it's COVID, but it was also like, it's, it's magma. It's pretty fun. You know, like, it looks like a good time. Like, why would I not want to be a part of it? Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're getting towards the end of this cause we, are, we have been on for a while and I appreciate yeah. your time. So no the, last, the last of my questions before we start, before we get into the couple of viewer questions is, um, what are your goals going forward? Cause you were talking about, you got, you got these big ambitions, you know? So what, so what goals do you have like in the competition side and what goals do you have on the film side? Um, I think goals for me, like just moving forward is I definitely want to like make a statement for myself and in contests, you know, I mean, I like the way I always looked at the contest is like a proving ground, you know, you go there and you prove what you can do and you prove that you can be like one of the best and then you're able to go and film um and filming has kind of just like weirdly put itself in because of uh, of my doing but it would it, it it's just like put itself in my life more like earlier on than i was really expecting you know um so now filming's kind of like something that i just really enjoy to do and i get to do but um uh with the contest it's still where i want to prove myself the most you know so i think for me mostly it's like I would like to go to the Olympics just, I mean, I think for my parents, that's a really cool aspect for my family, you know, like they get to see that and they get to do that for me personally, just like X games and world cups and stuff. Like those are really, really, really big parts of the reason I skied for this whole time. So I do want to do well in those. I want to medal in those so I can have that and kind of put that on my back, you know, and know that I I've done that. And then um, I think for, the filming side of things, I just, I really want to just put out the best stuff I can, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to be entertaining for people to watch. I want people to be stoked on like what I'm doing. I want to, I want to do a lot of the things that I grew up looking up to, you know, and Simon Dumont for me is a really, really good example. Like he was a contest dude who went out and filmed these insane video parts and had records that he was doing and stuff like that. He made skiing seem bigger than life itself, you know? And for me, I think moving forward and I'm still young and stuff, I want like, those are things I want to do. I want to make skiing seem big to people, you know? I want it to kind of catch the viewer's eye and realize that it's it's a really cool thing and it's a beautiful thing. And um, I, I just, I want to prove that to people and I want to prove my ability to people and let them see that like, I'm in this because I love the sport. I'm a like um I, I I want it, you know, and um yeah, I, I come up with new goals all the time, but just the core goals are definitely something that I'm just trying to like check off. And so hopefully I'm able to do them all soon. Hell yeah. I mean that's inspiring, man. That's uh and it's like you're the sec it's like the second coming of of these well rounded skiers that want to be great like great in competitions and great in the off season. So I think that's like, that's what oh, I need. We, we need more people like you and a hall and like Henrik's doing it too. Like we need, we need more people like you guys. Word. I appreciate that. That's kind. Yeah. Um, so I got a couple viewer questions. So the first one's from my buddy Grant. He asks, uh, what's the vibe at competitions between the athletes? Um, and you know, I was talking to him about this, um, so this kind of spawned from both our brains, but it's like, what's the vibe between athletes within the team and like between athletes from different countries? Um, it's, it's a really good, like, like crew. I mean, at the end of the day, we all tra travel in very, very similar places. I mean, there's with slope style too, but even more half pipe because half pipes, a small group of dudes. First of all, there's not as many heads in it. There's, um, there's way less half pipes in the world, you know? I mean, at any given time, there's probably like 
two, maybe three half pipes in the world, you know, and one of those is going to be cut well. So you, everyone kind of flocks to one like central area um, and we all kind of follow a pretty similar path. So everyone is together quite often. Um, there's no one I've really ever met in skiing where I'm like, this guy blows, you know, <laughs> like he's not fun to be around, whatever. So he, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a really cool dynamic, you know, we're all competing against each other, but we all want the best for each other. You know, you got all the boys and they're all stoked for each other. There's girls out there that are rocking and we get to travel with and, it, it, I mean, it's, it's just, everyone is just a support. It's just a supportive competitive, uh, feeling, you know, like it's, it's everyone you use, you, you want the best and you want to win, but you, you want everyone else to like walk out of it and be stoked on their day. And I mean, if you didn't win, one of your buddies did, you know, <laughs> like that's, that's a feeling of the whole thing. And then I think with our teams, like individually, you know, um, I mean, they, uh, the team really does just become your family, you know? So it's, I mean, it's, it, they, I mean, you're with them all the time, all year long, your problems are their problems, you know, type of thing. So you, uh, it's, it's, it's just skiing is one big family. Like that's what the whole sport is. So it's, it's really, really cool. Yeah. That, that's super sick. Um, the next one also related to, uh, to competition. So a dubs, uh, Dubes, hope you get better because he's hurt right now. No. Kind, of a, kind of a shitty way. So hope you get better soon. <laughs> Heal so, up, man. Yeah. So uh, do you feel you would have a better career trajectory skiing pipe versus slope style? So I think we've already covered this, but that's what he was uh, he was wondering. So you're just going all out on on the pipe, right? Yeah. Yeah. For me personally, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't think I could really ever see myself competing in slope style. It's just those guys are too talented in their own realm, you know, and all the time that I've spent at half pipe, those guys have spent on jumps and, and rails, you know? So like, it, it, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not that naturally talented, you know, like I'm naturally talented to a certain extent, but after a certain point, you just got to put in work. And so those guys have been putting in work and they're in their own realm. And I, I like half pipe too much. So I would just see myself really competing in half pipe and then filming is kind of where I put like my jumping and other stuff in play. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, Rolf uh, is asking uh, what's your dream sponsorship. So like if you could collab with anyone or get sponsored by any company, like who, who who's your, uh, what is it? What's the saying? The white whale? Like who are you, <laughs> who are you looking for? Um, I mean, I think Red Bull, you know, I mean, who wouldn't say Red Bull, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not like, I mean, and nowadays it's almost like, like Monster has a cooler team, you know, and I mean, Red Bull, just like the way they treat their athletes and how like sick they are with backing like projects and ideas. Like, it's like, I think almost anyone would really like, if they're being honest, they would just say Red Bull. Like, it's just like a pretty easy answer. If, if not Red Bull, I would say like, I don't know. Mountain Dew would be a pretty sick company to be on too if they put a skier on. Like that would be so rad. Just have a fucking Mountain Dew sticker right in the center of your helmet or something, you know? Or I mean, you got a car sponsor, you know? You could go with like Toyota, that would be cool, you know. Maserati, put a Lamborghini sticker on your shit, <laughs> Tesla, whatever. But I think, I mean, if we're talking about like actual ski companies, unless they brought back in Target or something, I would say Red Bull. Word. Word. Yeah. And uh, so this, so this is like my final question that I usually ask people. So what advice would you give to someone wanting to do what you do? So like the, the middle schooler right now that wants to be a, a competitive skier, like what advice are you giving these kids? Uh, I would just say just at the end of the day, just ski for yourself. You know, there's, there's so many things that uh, I've been caught up in, in my head over time, you know, like, like, companies for example you know like not giving you the time of day or not giving you money you know or not want to sponsor you or whatever it is and um you get really 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 wrapped up in it sometimes and i'm still working on this but i would say like at the end of the day if you're skiing for you um people people will like catch on to what it is and like w w what you're about you know you just got to be true to yourself and true to what you want to do on skis you know or outside of skiing you know it's just whatever but don't let them control you or dictate how you feel or 
or uh, what, you, what you think your value is. You know, I would say just really be be confident in yourself and ski hard, ski all day long, and just fucking prove them wrong. Word. Hunter, want to thank you for coming on today. It was so sick getting to know you and getting like all the behind the scenes. This was this was a lot of fun. Yeah, right on. I appreciate you listening to me, and yeah, it was it was fun being here. Hell yeah.